Good evening, everyone, and a good Erev Shabbos to you. Happy Thanksgiving to those who are observing. It's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you to our evening, our night of learning, together with some great Tamidi Chachamim and wonderful speakers. It's truly a privilege and a pleasure. We're so grateful to them for agreeing to be with us uh, this evening. The topic is Tcheilas. The topic is a Tcheilas revolution. And we all know the Torah obligates us to have tzitzis in the corners of our garment and Tcheilas with them as well. And the Gemara Menachos tells us in Daf Mem Gimel, that Rameir used to teach Manashtana Tcheilas Mikom Big Minei Tzivonim. Why was that color chosen of all of the possible colors? Nesha Tcheilas Doma Liyam V'yam Doma L'Rakia V'Rakia Doma L'Kisei HaKavod. Tcheilas reminds us, that color, that turquoise, that deep blue, reminds us of the ocean, of the sea, which reminds us of the heavens, which reminds us ultimately of the Kisei HaKavod, of God's divine throne. Tcheilas invokes the notion of imagination. And even though one looks at, one peers at one thing, or Isimo so, one is supposed to look at the corner of their garment. There's what they physically see, the contrast of the blue and the white. But when one invokes the imagination and vision, you can see and you can dream and you can believe in so much more. We are right now in a pandemic. We're in a difficult time. And when we look at what is right in front of us, when we look at what's on the surface, we see one thing. But the Jewish people exist. Our tenacity, our resiliency, we are here because the Torah, with its call for Amuna, with its charge for Bitachon, tells us, to use our imagination, to not only look at what is right in front of us, but to allow the power of the imagination to bring us all the way up to the Kisei HaKavod, to believe in something so much bigger and something so much more. And that is the solution to redemption. And so on this day, on this weekend, and really for a Jew each and every day, as we're called Yehudim L'Chidush Yarim, a people of gratitude, we don't just see what is in front of us and feel pessimistic or sad. We see so much more that is beyond. We see the guiding hand of the Ribbona Shalom, and for that we feel so grateful. I want to thank our Rosh Beis Medrash here at the Dr. Yitzchak Belazan Beis Medrash of Boker Raton Synagogue, Rabbi Simi Shabtai, for dreaming, for imagining this beautiful program on an evening with so many are not involved in learning to bring the learning to the masses. I want to thank him for his vision, and I want to thank him for reaching out. There are 54 communities across North America and beyond who have partnered to come together for Torah learning tonight. And that is an enormous statement, an extremely powerful statement, and we're so grateful to all the communities, all the shuls, all the Rabbanim who have partnered, who have joined with us, together with BRS 55 in total communities who are spending this evening in Talmud Torah and in learning on this important subject that reminds us to invoke our power of imagination. May we see the Kisei HaKavod right in front of us, not as if it's real, but because it's real. And may we merit for the Kisei HaKavod, for the Ribbonu Shalom, to transform us from a period of darkness to the period of light to be able to distinguish between the dark and the light, and to know that it's day, that the sun will yet rise, that we will turn that corner on this period and experience his geula, Mirza Shem B'meir of Yameinu. Our first speaker this evening, my dear colleague and friend, Rabbi Dr. David Shabtai, is the Rav of the Sephardic Minion here at the Boker Raton Synagogue. He is a medical doctor who has written what is a very popular and important book called Defining the Moment on Brain Death. He's also the author of the forthcoming book on Purim called Hiding in Plain Sight. He's a Rebbe in several of the schools in our community. And it's a great honor and privilege to be able to welcome Rabbi Dr. David Shabtai. Thank you so much, Rabbi Goldberg. Um, thank you, Rabbi Simi Shabtai, for putting this all together. I have the privilege of uh, starting us off and giving some of the background. So we're going to be discussing some of the history, the archaeology, the chemistry, what makes Tcheles Tcheles. So we'll start with some of the history. Because it's somewhat interesting, this is one of the few mitzvot in the Torah which we, until recently, really haven't had the opportunity to do. It's a mitzvah that seems to have disappeared somewhat. And so it's important to try to figure out when that happened, what happened, when, why, and what has happened recently to change all of that. And so we know that the Torah talks about the mitzvah of Tchelet when it comes to tzitzis, when it comes to big day kehuna. It's an assumption that we know what this is. It's something that's available. It's something that each and every single person was required to have. So it sounds at the very least that Tcheles is something that exists, it's something that's common, it's something that's well known, um, but it's also something that's unique. It's reserved for the big day kahuna, it's reserved for a certain number of strings on tzitzis, but it doesn't seem to be something that's all that common, but something that certainly exists. We know that when the, Beitamik, the first Beitamik was destroyed, so your Miyahu Hanavi, um, right? So Midalot Ha'am, Hishir Nevuzarad Amrava Tabachim Lechormim Uli Yogavim, that Nebuzaradan left a number of people in Eretz Yisrael. He didn't. He left. He didn't exile everybody. 
And the Gemara explains, who are these Chormim and Yogvim? Yogvim refer to those who made Tchelas. They were on the coast. They were necessary for the Tchelas production. As we'll see, Tchelas production is not something that can be done everywhere. It has to be done only where Tchelas is found. It comes from a snail. It comes from a sea creature. And so it needs to be found by that sea creature. Eretz Yisrael is on the coast. And it made sense to leave people there who knew what they were doing. It was a skill. It wasn't something that everybody could do. It's something that many, many people wanted. It was a sign of royalty and regality, we'll see. And they made sense to leave them there. So we know that certainly during the time, the at the end of the first base HaMikdash, should exist during the time of the second base HaMikdash, we know that the Big Day Kahuna continued to have Chelas. And we know that the Gemara in Menachot, many hundreds of years later, talks about the fact that they know how to make Chelas. Says Amar Leia Bailer of Shmuel Bar Yehuda, Bar Yehuda, Hat Chilta Hechi Tzav Itula. How do you, how do you die Tchelet? And he tells him he has a recipe for how to die Tchelet, and we'll see some of the details of this as we go on. But at the very least, we see that it was something that was at least known throughout the time of the Gemara. Meaning, even though, even though the Jews had left Eretz Yisrael already in the time of the Gemara, this at least existed somewhat that they were aware that this happened, and it seems like people were still aware of how to dye the trellis, even though it will show that already it seems to have been coming more rare. We get the idea that at the time of the Geonim, the period after the Gemara, that's when we sort of lost both the tradition for how to make trellis, we lost any remnants of trellis, we don't have the tradition, we don't know where it's found, and we'll see that it's during the time of the Geonim that we cease to have trellis and it ceases to be part of the mitzvah. It just disappears and we just don't have any more. And then the story of Chelos takes a huge, huge gap in the timeline. Since the time of the Gaonim after the Gemara, until the 1800s, very little happens in the world of Chelos. And then comes along the Ritzin Rebbe, Rav Gershon Hanach Leiner, the author of many works. He has a fascination with Chelos and he wants to reinvigorate it. And he wrote a whole bunch of svarim on it. He has on the called a whole bunch of svarim. He wants to reinvigorate the mitzvah of chilet. He wants to find out what it is. And he does a whole bunch of research. And, and according to him, he posits that it is a it's a crustacean called a cuttlefish. The problem is he doesn't know how to make dye from a cuttlefish. We know it has to be from a chilazon. The Gemara says that all chilas has to be from a chilazon, as we'll see. It's a type of a sea creature, but we don't know what it was. We lost that tradition during the time of the late Gemara, during the time of the Gon, and we don't know what it is. He's trying to recreate it based on hints that we find in the Gemara, which we'll see shortly. And he suggests that it's a cuttlefish, but he doesn't know how to extract dye from this cuttlefish. It's not his specialty. He goes to Italy to try to find a chemist who can help him extract dye from the cuttlefish. And as we'll see, he suggests it needs to be a dark blue dye. And he finds a chemist who's able to do it. And he says, this is the trellis. And he then starts, he then starts dipping his tzitzis in it. And for many years, the Redzina Hasidim wear his trellis. There was a lot of opposition to it back in the day, both based on hashkafic, halachic, and later some scientific challenges as well. It turns out that the trellis that was made for the Redzina Rebbe by this chemist in Italy, the blue was not actually an extract of the of the cuttlefish. What it was instead was, in order to turn the fish, to get the dye out, to get it onto the wool, a whole bunch of other chemicals need to be added and the process needs to be done. And it turns out that that process was what made the citrus blue. It wasn't actually the fish. If you left the fish out, it would still turn blue. And therefore, many showed that this cannot be really what the trellis is, because even without the fish, it would be blue. And we know that it has to come from a fish. Here, the fish isn't necessary to the process. And a little bit later, in 1913, Rabbi Yitzchak Herzog, who will then become the chief rabbi of Israel, currently then he was the chief rabbi of Ireland, writes a PhD thesis. He calls it porphyrology, the study of argaman, of trellat, of dyes that were used in the Mishkan and the Big Day Kahuna. And he also is at a loss to try to figure out how exactly is he going to figure out how to get from the snail or the fish to the dye. And he suggests, in fact, that it might be the Murex trunculus. The Murex trunculus is a, is a snail. Uh, he just doesn't know how to get it to be blue. And he suggests that that's potentially a problem because he knows it needs to be blue. And if it can't come from the snail, he doesn't know how to figure it out. He should be, it could be, but he can't make it happen. And only much later, in 1985, did Ravelli Tavger figure out this to figure out the secret of how to do it. Because you see, Historically speaking, 
Historically speaking, this snail, this murex trunculus, was used to make both purple and deep blue. And the challenge was, was that when anybody tried to do it in modern times, all they could get was purple. And they didn't understand, well, if it needs to be a blue. And so this seems to be an argument that the murex trunculus could not be the snail from which Tchelas was made because it doesn't make blue. Until Rav Tavger figured out the secret to how it is, which we'll see in the chemistry section. So in terms of archaeology, how do we know what was what was this? This suggestion is currently that it should be the murex trunculus snail. So what evidence is there historically and archaeologically to prove that it's true? So we know that Chelas was used for many things in the rest of the world, aside from Sitzis and Bigdei Kahuna. The Ramban writes that this was what the royalty wore, was something that was reserved for royalty. And he says, That's what they wore. And he even continues later and says, even nowadays, it's rare, and it's only found among the aristocracy. The Gemara seems to indicate that it was used for other things as well. And in fact, it suggests that if a person finds Tchelas on Shabbos, can they assume that it's made for Tzitzis or not? But the assumption is the Gemara in Erevin assumes that Tchelas was used for other uses also, not just Tzitzis. Meaning that the dyeing industry was the common dyeing industry. That which was used for Tchelas for the Tzitzis was also used for other types of garments. And so it should be the same process. It should be the same snail that was used for Tzitzis, was used for these other products, these other clothing. The Gemara in Erevin wants to know different cloth that's found on Shabbos, what its status is, assuming that they're all done with the same, they look all identical meaning that the tzitzis was used, the dye that was used, the snail that was used to produce the dye was the same all around. And it's interesting because the Gemara Menachos assumes that there's only two things that could possibly make that same color. It could be tchelas or something called kela ilan. It either comes from the chila zone, from the snail that's used to, to, for the mitzvah of tchelas, or something called kela ilan. Now kela ilan, as we'll show a little bit later, is indigo. There's a lot of uh, Rishonim, Geonim, the Aruch, writes that Kela Ilan is indigo, and we're pretty sure we know what indigo is. It's something that's been used. It's a, it's a plant-based dye, which is common and easy to use. And the Gemara assumes here that if you find something of this color, it's either Tchelas or Kela Ilan. There are only two options for what this color could have come from. So it's either Tchelas or Kela Ilan. So if we find that they were using this color, it must have been either for the, for produced by the chilas and for chilas or for kela ilan. And those are the only two options there are for producing this color that the Gemara is aware of. Where was it found? So Pasuk and Yecheskel points out that chilat v'argam and miye elisha, and the Targum explains mimindinat Italia, which we know from secular sources is where a lot of dye production was used, particular particularly of this Murex trunculus snail. This puzzling embrace is Zvulun l'chof yami miskon v'u l'chof on yod v'yar chato al tzidon. That Zvulun, which was um, heavily involved in the shipping and sailing industry, was on the coast in order to accomplish that. And from in the northern part of Eretz Yisrael until Sidon. And the Gemara in Shabbos points out that you, the same puzzle that we saw earlier of the Yogvim, in Pasuk in Yirmiya, Elut Sayyad Achilazon. So, where did the Achilazon found? Misulamot Shal Tzur Ve'ad Chaifa. In this very area where Zivulun was found. And if you take a look at the map of Israel from Chaifa until Tzur, so Chaifa's in the bottom, on the bottom of the map, Tyre is Tzur on the top. And precisely that is the, those are the locations where we found archaeological evidence of Tchelas and of snail produced dye industry, and particularly of the Murex trunculus snail. We've also found coins in those areas that depict the snail, the Murex snail, on them as well. If you take a look carefully, you could see the Murex snail on it. Now, I have to remember, this was a symbol of royalty. This wasn't something that was so common. And to wear the Argaman, to wear the Tchelas, was something to be proud of. And they put it on their coins, and we found many of these coins in that area. And that is precisely the shape of the snail that was used. And we see from here that it was common, this was the commonly produced dye. The dye that was done for these purposes was from this snail. We see also in terms of the language that the term tchilas is used as in, in, the, in, in Medrash and Rabba, and in Medrash Hagadol, in many Midrashim as porphyrin or porphyra, which is porpora, which is the language that 
in Latin and in Greek, which relates to this very snail. We see evidence in the Ravya. The Ravya says that he's talking about Tchelas in the Gemara in Brachos, and he says that the Tchelas is called Porphyrin. We see in the Mekar Chaim, the Chavas Yair, he writes that it's from Porphyr, and that's the same color. He says, both of the ain't no blue. He says it's a little bit different, interesting, but he still uses the same language to refer to Tchelas, and we know from all over the secular literature that Porphyra or Porphyr is referring to this Murex trunculus. We see also in Kabbalistic works, discussing other things also, where Tchelas is referred to as Porphyra at the bottom, Kizen Nikra Porphyra, Demalka and Nikra Beged Tchelas. Regardless of what that means in a spiritual terms, spiritual mystical terms, he's clearly using the word porphyra and tchelas to mean similar things. And we know from secular sources that that's true. Also, we know from Pliny the Elder in natural history, he refers to porpora and these purples and blue dyes that come from the Murex trunculus. We know from Aristotle a number of places who refers to these sea creatures, the Murex, the porphyra, the Murex snails as the source of the blue and the purple. And in in other languages, in Greek and in German, I'm going to trust them that that's accurate, or at least the Google Translate translation was accurate, that these things mean porpora or porphyra, and uh, they're also referring to this purple dye, the purple fish, the murex fish. Um, and so we know that the chazal, when they refer to it, that's what they were referring to. The timing. So we know that mar mimashche aiti tchelet bishnei ravachai. That when Rav Achai, who's living towards the end of the Gemara period, someone brought Tchelas, and it was something to be noted. It wasn't something that was available. It was something that someone brought it, and the Gemara took a note to say, hey, this is something interesting. This is not something that was very well established then. The Gemara in Sanhedrin points out, It was a miracle that the Zug, these two Talmud Chachamim, came to visit Rava, also living towards the latter end of the Gemara period. And they came from Eretz Yisrael, Rashi writes on the bottom, that Rekes is Tveria. They were caught by the Persians and they had Chilas with them. And this is something that was unique. They had to bring it from Eretz Yisrael. It's something that was notable. It was not something that seems to be terribly common, although it seems that they were familiar with it even during the time of the later period of the Gemara. You know, from the Ramban, we know that Many Rishonim point out that they no longer had chelas in the Middle Ages. The Ramban explicitly says that Mimosa Geonim, that already from the Geonim period, they no longer had chelas. It was towards the end of the Gemara they did, and already towards the Geonim period, they no longer did. And in secular sources, we see something similar as well. In the Twelve Caesars about Nero, that uh, they were going to punish people who were producing tchelat for non-royal purposes. We know from Codex Theodosius, which is a, a, a rule promulgated in 427 CE, which is towards the latter end of the Gemara period, that people were not allowed to use the dye, the imperial purple or the blues, products of the Murex trunculus snail, to do regular mundane everyday things. It was only reserved for royalty. And we know in Codex Justinianus in 470, where, if you read the Latin carefully, referring both to the purpura and to the murex, that producing it for a non-royal purpose was punishable by death. Which is kind of interesting, because it helps explain why a mitzvah in HaTorah was somewhat lost. How else could... It's a mitzvah in HaTorah. It's shocking, almost, that it's something that we lost the Mesorah for, something that people may have given their lives for, but if there was a risk of death in doing these things, so it understandably fell away. When the Jewish population moved to Bavel and there was no longer a significant Jewish population there at Israel, and producing it was on the pain of death, it's understandable on some level why it was lost. And the timeline, the secular timeline, corresponds very well with our, with Chazal. We even found, we found um, wool-based and, uh, and cloth-based tchelet dyes from those periods from early, early on, um, to show that this was being done, particularly in those locations, um, and that we know that it was around at that time, and we don't really find it much thereafter. So how does Chelos work? The color scheme, how exactly does it make sense, and how does it work? So what's the chemistry behind it? So what's the color? So the color of Chelos, as Rabbi Goldberg mentioned earlier, it's the Gemara in Sot, the Gemara in Chulin. Rabbi Meir Omer, why was Chelos picked as, as unique? 
מפני שהתחילה דומה לים, וים דומה לרקיע, ורקיע דומה לכיסא הכבוד. תחילה reminds us of the sea, the sea reminds us of the sky, and the sky reminds us of God's throne of glory. If I had to guess then, it sounds like we're talking about a type of a blue. It's true, the sky has a variety of hues and a variety of shades, but it's blue. The sea can have a variety of shades, it's reflecting the sky, this clearly seems to be blue. There are some who suggested that, no, it means something else, but it would, to my mind, it would seem terribly misleading of Chazal to give us all of these analogies and say, hey, but it was red, or it was purple, or something else. If it's referring to the sky, it's referring to something that's blue. Now, the sky can change during the day, during the nighttime, as it gets evening. The colors do indeed change, but it's referring to blue. And so we mentioned earlier it needs to be a blue. And we pointed out earlier that there are two sources of this blue dye. The first was Tchelas from the Chila zone, and the second was Kela Ilan from Indigo. And the Gemara of Metziah says, the Gemara points out that the Torah reminds us that we have to remember the Exodus from Egypt numerous times. One of them is by Tzitzis. So why does he have to remind us by Tzitzis? So he says, it's as if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us, I am the one, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is refer- saying, who at Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was able to differentiate who was a firstborn and who wasn't during the plague of the firstborn. So too, I can tell the difference, who me, the last line, someone who dyes their tzitzis with Kela Ilan to produce the same color and says that it's Tchelas. Because the colors are so similar, that you could fool somebody. The colors are so very similar that you can't tell the difference by looking. Indeed, Chazal have some interesting type of a test in order to, a bunch of chemicals put together in order to figure out how to differentiate the two from each other. Very hard to understand what that means. The Ayavet says we have very difficult time understanding how these tests are used. But from a visual perspective, they look identical. And so clearly there were, you could have, in theory, dyed your tzitzis with Kela Ilan and produced the same color. You wouldn't have fulfilled the mitzvah. And the Gemara here is saying that seemingly it was something that could have been done. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is clearly saying, no, that's wrong. You must use the chilazam. Now we know what Kela Ilan is. Kela Ilan is indigo. We know from the Aruch, we know from Sadiago, we know from tons of Rishon that Kela Ilan is indigo. And we know exactly what indigo looks like. We know how to produce it. It comes from a plant and we know exactly what it is. Tchelas, therefore, should look very, very, very similar. And in fact, the dye produced by the Murex trunculus snail is exactly the same chemical composition as Kela Ilan. It's, as we'll see shortly, it's the same exact chemical, and therefore it looks exactly the same. The only difference is the source of the dye. Did it come from an indigo plant or did it come from a chilazon? And that makes all the difference when it comes to the mitzvah. In terms of the dying process, so we saw this Gemara Menachah before. Amar Le'Abayla of Shmuel Bar Yehuda, Bar of Yehuda, had chel tehechit zavitulu. What do you do? So how do you die tchelas? Because that's what we're going to need to know. What do you do to this snail to see? Could it be a snail from which you can produce tchelas? Amar Le'Abayla, my tina dam chilazon. You have to bring the dam of the chilazon. And elsewhere, Tosfos points out that it's not actually the blood of the chilazon. It needs to be in a separate. It's not part of the circulatory system of the chilazon. It's a separate sac which in the Murex trunculus, it indeed is. It's called the brachial gland. It's a separate gland that has this dye. Visamanim and some other chemicals. Or and you have to heat it up. And you have to test a little bit in an egg. And you test it. You get rid of that and you use tchelas for something else. And the Rambam writes, Kate and Sovit Tchelas, when he summarizes this halacha, he says, he says, it's the normal way that we dye things. It was the regular dyeing process. It was the regular process used to dye things. Now, the Gemara seems to indicate that Tchelas is a color that is, a, it has, is very fast, meaning it doesn't come off easily, which also means, if you think about it, it's very hard to get on. It doesn't dissolve easily in water. And so what you need to do first is a reduct it's called reduction in order to get it to be dissolvable in water and stick to the dye stick to the to the wool rather and that's why we heat it up and that that the, the gemara seems to be indicating there was a fermentation process that took place that they would use to reduce it we can use chemicals nowadays they would leave a little bit of the flesh of the snail in there with the bacteria on it which would reduce the dye and then it would be able to adhere 
to the wool. But this was the common way of doing, of dyeing. It's called the vat dyeing. And in fact, there was a show, um, there was a show produced in England called The Worst Jobs in History, which uh, actually tried to see, could you do this? The people from the Pilt Health Association were in touch with them about, we understand that using our current methods, you could take this Murex trunculus chilazone and produce Trelas from it. Were, Chaza, were they able to do it given the technology and the science available back in the day? And they go through a whole episode here, and you unfortunately can't see the, uh, you can't hear it, but they show, and you can watch it on YouTube, how you can actually produce it using only tools and chemicals that were available to Chazal. It still works. Now, from the dying perspective, and what was a challenge for Rav Herzog was okay, we can't get it to be blue though. Throughout the generations, all they could do is get it to be purple. And it's sometimes called Tyrian purple. Tyrian from Tyre, from Tsur, Tyrian purple. So how do you get it to be blue? And this was a challenge that Rivera said, it can't be the Murex, Trunculus, because it doesn't turn blue. And so what Rav Tavger found out in 1985 was, it's true. There's a reduction um, reaction that has to happen in order to get the dye to stick to the wool. But then it can get oxidized. Then there can be a photoreaction that happens afterwards. When you, when you expose the trellis to light right after it was reduced, the dibromo indigo goes away. The bromines, the bromines release, and what's left is blue. And so when you're dying, when you're dying it, when you're producing the dye, it looks like this greenish, bluish, yellowish mix. It doesn't actually look blue at all. And this is perhaps what Chazal meant. When they said you have to do a tima with an eggshell, so you take an eggshell because it doesn't look blue. They don't know what it's actually going to be because you have to expose it both to air and light. And so while it's in the liquid form, it doesn't look blue. And so they would take a little bit of they would take a little bit out in an eggshell and dip some wool into it and see will will it actually turn blue? Because you can't tell in the process; you can only tell from the from the final process. And this is the dibromo indigo molecule. This is what makes it look purple. And when it's exposed to air and light, the bromines, the two brs on the edge come off and it turns into a blue. And you see here as they're producing it, it's on the Pilt Color website, that it's yellow in the beaker. Once they dip the wool into the beaker, it comes out and in front of your eyes, it turns to blue. I've seen it, it's a fascinating thing to watch. It goes from yellow to blue, um, something you can't transmit exactly through, the, through Zoom. It's a very stinky process because um, the snails kind of smell, but you can watch it happen in front of your eyes to turn from yellow into blue. And it's for that reason that this snail is assumed to be, is the Pilchel Association assumes, and many posts can assume that this snail is the one that produces the chelas. And in fact, there's a there's a nice little contrast called um, Levusha Aron by Rabbi Hellman, who points out that in order to assume that the murex is not the chelas, a lot of things have to happen. And the reason that You'd have to assume that the murex was around as something else. It was something else was found exactly in those areas. Something else was referred to as purpura. Something else could, something else could produce such a strong dye. Something else was identical to Kayla Elon. Something else would only be able to be differentiated by a fading. Something else must be extracted while alive. We didn't mention it earlier. Tosa point. The Gemara points out in Shabbos that the snail to be used for tchelas, it's better to use to extract the dye while the snail is alive or right after it dies. Otherwise, it doesn't work as well. And that's true with the murex trunculus is an enzyme in the brachial gland called purpurase that you need in order for the reaction to take place. And soon after the snail dies, that enzyme starts to degrade and isn't useful anymore. It only works immediately after it was killed. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And you'd have to assume that all of these things were true in order to assume that this was not the snail that was used for trellis. However, only the murex has documentation, both in secular literature. Only, we don't have any Mesorah on anything else. We don't have any information on any of the others. And then Chazal never mentioned something else. Chazal mentioned two sources, this Chilazon or Kela Ilan, seemingly arguing that both the, the history, the archaeology, and the chemistry would all support suggesting that the murex trunculus is the snail that was used for Trelas in antiquity. So I'll pass the baton now over back to Rabbi Goldberg to uh, transition to Rabbi Leibowitz.
You did not hear any of that. I was on mute the whole time. Okay. <laughs> I apologize to everybody. It is a great honor. Thank you so much for having Rabbi Arya Libowitz, my dear Javier and friend. Thank you so much, everyone who is currently texting me to unmute. I appreciate that. Also, my dear friends, Rabbi Libowitz is the rub of the Beis Knesset of North Woodmere, the director of Smicha Yeshiv University, the Mechaber of uh, Two Svarim Kona Olamo, two volumes. I'm sure many more yet to come out. And among the most prolific uh, teachers of Torah in the world today, offline and online, sought out f- everywhere. And while Rabbi Dr. Shabbat Shabtai offered a very compelling argument that the uh, modern Tchelas are, in fact, halachically uh, the Tchelas, there are points and counterpoints within the uh, modern day postgame. And we're so grateful to Rabbi Libowitz who joined us this evening in order to share them with us. I apologize again for being muted. Thank you so much, Rabbi Libowitz. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming and learning with us uh, this evening. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Dr. Shaptai, for an absolutely beautiful presentation on all of the proofs and all of the explanations for why it is that we are so confident that we have, in fact, rediscovered the Tcheles. And I want to thank Rabbi Goldberg and uh, the entire Boko Raton Synagogue community for their uh, leadership in bringing all of these shuls together for this wonderful learning opportunity. Now, when we go through all of the proofs, all of the uh, wonderful rayos that uh, Rabbi Dr. Shaptai just mentioned, there's always one question that people ask at the end of all of it, and that is, if it's really true, if it's really right, if this is a mitzvah daraisa that has reappeared and that we now have an opportunity to do, why aren't the gedolim all screaming that this is something that we have to do? Where are the gedolim Yisrael leading the path and telling us that of course it's a mitzvah daraisa? Of course we have to wear tcheles. After all, it's a very healthy question for a Jew to ask that if there's going to be a change, a modification in the way we behave, in the way we observe, a mitzvah, it better be led by the Eine Ha'eda, by those who are uh, our Chachme Hador, those who are our leaders, though, those who are our Chachamim. And to the contrary, if I personally might be convinced that something is true, but the Chachme Hador were to tell me otherwise, so normally I have to trust their judgment if uh, I, I know that my own judgment might be in error. Al yamin shu small, val small shu yamin. Not if I know that they're for sure wrong. If they're for sure wrong, I have to do what's right. But if it seems that it's their judgment against mine, we have to trust the judgment of the Chachme Hadar. So I, I want to discuss that question mostly. Why is it or that, that there is a perception at least that Chachme Hadar, that so many of the Gedolei Hadar do not wear Tcheles, and if they don't, why should, why should I? So first off, just before we, uh, we address some of the arguments against, it's important to realize that it's, it's really a, a, a false question to ask. Uh, why do the Chachmei Ador not wear Tcheles? Because many of them, in fact, do. Mi Gadol Me Moreno Hagon Rav Shechter Shlita, who is going, going to be joining us this evening and sharing with us Divrei Torah in just a short time, uh, who, who wears the Tcheles and who uses the Tcheles and has inspired so many of us to use the Tcheles. The great Gon, Rav Zalman Nechemya Goldberg, the son-in-law of Rav Shlomo Zalman Arbach, and uh, Baki and Kala Torakula, who just passed away recently, uh, was, was someone who very clearly and openly wore Tcheles. Uh, the Gon Rav Yisrael Belsky Zatzal, Rav Shiva Torah Vedas, also wore Tcheles, and many, many others also wore Tcheles, some more secretly and privately, some more publicly. So to suggest that there's like this consensus amongst Gedolei Yisrael not to wear tcheles is not really true. It's a split amongst Gedolei Yisrael. Well, let's discuss some of the reasons why not. And, you know, I started thinking about this issue because it seems when you, you hear what Dr. Shabta, Rabbi Dr. Shabtai just said, it, it, it seems so compelling. You know, all of the assumptions one would have to make to assume that the Murex trunculus die is not tcheles are, are so far out. It just seems so forced to say that it's not the Tcheles. So it really bothered me to try to understand why is it that so many people still aren't wearing this Tcheles? It's an opportunity for a mitzvah da'araisa. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that when you look only at the Gemaras and the Rishonim, if you look only at the, uh, the passages that we have in Chazal, you could probably read it one way or the other. 
You could read them, in most of them, in, in both directions. There's no explicit Gemara that's against the idea that Mirak's Tranquilus is Tcheles, but it's possible to, uh, to read some of the Ma'amari Chazal in the other direction as well. For example, the Gemara Mesech HaShabbos, Dafay and Dalib, tells us that they used to trap the Chilazon with a net. That doesn't seem like the wisest way to trap these snails, and uh, therefore many have suggested this is a proof that the Murex is not the Tcheles. The Gemara Mesech HaShabbos, Daf Ayin Heyom Aleph, says that if a person traps the Chilazon, he's Chayuv Mishum Tzeda. It is a violation of the on Shabbos, if one were to do this on Shabbos, of trapping an animal. But we know what the rule is by trapping an animal on Shabbos. If you can catch that animal in a single lunge, then you are not Chayiv Mishum Tzeda. You didn't trap it, you just took it. You know, when I go to my fish tank, I happen to have a fish tank at home, a saltwater fish tank with four chilazons in it right now. Who knows, maybe they'll reproduce and I'll have more. But when, when I want to pick up a, a chilazon, I don't have to lunge and go after it and all I do is I stick my hand in and I pull out a chilazon and that's it. And I have it. So some have suggested that that's a proof that the snail that we have found is in fact not the chilazon because the Gemara says that you're chayiv mishum tzeda. Now the, the obvious uh, response would be uh, we didn't uh, catch chilazons from my fish tank. It's from the bottom of the ocean that we get chilazons. And although they are slow moving snails, they, they are, you watch them move around, they're very slow moving snails. But to get to the bottom of the ocean and find them and catch them, it's a big avoda. It's not so easy. I'm sure some of the people who are uh, on the Zoom this evening have uh, gone uh, scuba diving and uh, done the uh, the Chilazon uh, uh, scuba dive to uh, to find them at the bottom of the ocean floor. Not something that's easy to do without proper scuba gear. So you would imagine that would be uh, that would qualify as 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 in fact trapping. Or or for example, the Gemara Masech Sanhedrin Daf Tzadiyalov tells us that the chilazon has the ability to climb up a mountain, which means that the chilazon was out of water, could be out of water for an extended period of time and survive just in moist sand as it's climbing up a mountain. And it didn't seem that Murex can do this. So it's just this one I was never really sure how to answer. And just a couple of weeks ago, I went to a fellow in Muncie who reached out to me. His name is Danny Israel. And he has uh, fish tanks full of chilazons. He's breeding chilazons in his uh, in his fish tanks in, in, in Muncie. So he offered me a few of them. That's why I have four. I used to have just one. I picked up three more from him. And, uh, and, and when, when I was there, I asked him, where did you get all of these from? You know, you can't find them in America. So he said he had them shipped from Morocco. He had them shipped. And the person who was shipping them to him told him, I can't ship these. They're going to die. If I, if I put them in, in a package, you can't ship them in water. So they're going to die if they're out for so long. And, and, and as soon as they arrived and they were still alive, just wrapped in some wet cloth, he said, aha, the Gemara in Sanhedrin was correct that they're able to survive outside of the ocean. They're able to survive in moist, in, 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 in moist dirt outside of the ocean. The Gemara Menachel Staf Mem Dalet tells us, Briaso Domeladad, that the Chilazon is like a fish, or it looks like a fish, or its, its, its shape is like a fish. And uh, some who argue against the murex being the chilazon say, I don't see a fish when I look at it. I see a snail when I look at it. It doesn't look anything like a fish. So, you know, that's also a judgment call. I happen to have a, uh, a shell right here with me. I have a few, uh, this is, from, this is a, a deceased uh, chilazon. The chilazon is no longer, the shell is empty on the inside. But uh, some look at this and say, that's, that looks nothing like a fish. Others say, don't you see the shape of its entire body? How it's narrow and then widens and then narrow at the tail end? Isn't that exactly the shape of a fish. This is all, all a matter of judgment, meaning one can look at these Gemaras and say, yes, yes, that's exactly the murex. And one can look at these Gemaras and say, no, that is not at all. That, uh, that's not at all the murex. So one of the reasons that I think many people reject the murex as treles is not, does not really relate to the proofs from the Gemara itself, but many of the other proofs that Rabbi Dr. Shabtai referred to before. And by that, I mean the, the proofs from chemistry, from archaeology, from linguistics, 
from history. As we pointed out, chemistry tells us how it's almost exactly identical to the color Elon, which we know is the closest approximation of Tcheles. Archaeology tells us that the place where we found all of these shells, the digs where we found dying industries with all of these shells, were exactly in the location where they used to produce Tcheles. And the, uh, the, the, the fact that the, that the dye is such a strong dye that the only way to get it off the wool is to destroy the wool entirely in a bleach solution. It's such a strong dye, which is exactly how they described the dye of Tcheles. Or that uh, in, in archaeology, we know, based on archaeology, we know that they didn't have any other blue other that, that dyes this color blue other than indigo dye, than the color Elan and the murex. So it has to be that this is the uh, the correct one. Or based on linguistics, that chilazon, the word chilazon, doesn't mean fish. It means a snail, uh, like the murex. Or based on history, that the tcheles was lost at exactly around the same time that, uh, that that we lost the ability to, to extract blue from the from the murex. And uh, it's the, the scientific proofs for, from a, an academic standpoint, if a person is not looking based purely on Torah sources, and a person is looking at from an academic standpoint, it's a slam dunk. It's going to be very hard to find someone who's going to take an honest look at all of these disciplines and come to the conclusion that this is not the real Tcheles. So one group of people that rejected as Tcheles are generally suspicious of science and suspicious of any proofs that can be brought from science. For example, Rav Yashiv Zichron Levracha in his Kovitz Chuvos, Chelik Aleph Simon Beis, writes a little bit of the history of what Rabbi Dr. Shaptai mentioned, how the Redzina Rebbe was sure that he had found the Tcheles, and he had all the proofs in the world that he was sure were absolutely uh, positive to the, to the identity, to point to the identity of the, of the, of the Chilazim being uh, what he thought it was. And then... Later on, initially, Gidoli, many Gedoli Israel did not agree, and a short while later, they proved that he was incorrect. It was pretty, became pretty clear to everyone but Redzina Hasidim that, that the Redzina Rebbe was in fact incorrect. And then says Rav Yashiv, Shuv Achrei Tkufa Yosemu Cheres, sometime later, Kamu Anshei Mada. So people who have uh, knowledge of, of sciences uh, arose, Vita'anu, Shekol Masha Chazuad Ko, Shav Vita'falu, that everything that you saw until now was was wrong. Only they know what the real chilazim is. Says Rabbi Yashif, I don't know, just like the Redzina Rabbi was disproven, probably give it some time and, and, and this will be disproven as well. Meaning the scientific proofs aren't going to capture his imagination and they're certainly not going to cause him to pass in any differently because science changes. What science knows, if you look at you know a, a medical chart in the 1940s of what a, a perfect diet would be, a perfectly healthy diet, it's like a recipe for death nowadays. You know, the amount of uh, red meat and uh, maybe a cigarette after dinner to make a, it doesn't, it, it, science changes and what we know changes. And therefore, Rav Eliashev was very skeptical about this. A little less skeptical skeptical about science, but also skeptical about Cheles, is uh, the Gon Rav Asher Weiss Shlita, who in his Minchas Asher, Chelek Beis Simon Gimel says that, of course, of course we follow uh, scientific findings to determine a metzius, to determine what facts are, what the facts on the ground are. But says Rav Asher Weiss, archaeology? Archaeology is a pseudoscience. Archaeology is based on what we find, he writes, We're not dealing with a very precise kind of science. Everything is guesses and estimations. Oh, if I found all of these shells here, it must be this is where a dying industry was. It lacks the precision of a science like physics or chemistry. The, 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 the science of archaeology is filling in a lot of the story because we only have pieces of evidence when it comes to archaeology. And that's, I think, the, the first group of people who do not want to accept the Murex's Tcheles simply do so for a lack of, uh, of acceptance of the, of, the, uh, of the scientific proof, whether they're suspicious of, uh, of relying on science in, in general or specifically when it comes to archaeology. Uh, a second group is those who say, yes, I, I, I believe it and, and, and it fits all the Gemaras and I understand how it could be, but there's no way 
that you can wear a pair of tzitzis that will satisfy every shita in Rishonim, that will satisfy every opinion that exists. And since these things weren't paskined by the Shulchan Aruch, who are we to paskin? For example, I'll give you four, four examples, actually. Example number one, how many strings should you have that are blue and how many strings should you have that are white? A three-way machlokas rishonim, the Rambam, the Ravid, and Rashi and Tosos. The Rambam says one out of eight. The Ravid says two out of eight, meaning one out of four. And Rashi and Tosos, half of the strings. How are we supposed to decide between such giants among the Rishonim? Second, it, the, the Rishonim disagree as to the exact color of the Tcheles. They argue the Rambam uh, writes in the source that Rabbi Dr. Shapta I put up uh, on the uh, screen earlier, the Rambam writes that it's uh, the Dam of the Chilazon is black. It's black like ink. Rashi in Parshas Truma writes that it's yarok. It's like a yellowish uh, color. And Rov Rishonim assume that it's in fact blue. Now this, this question is not really such a major question. The Ramam describes the dam of the chilazon, not the finished product, not the dye that we turn into uh, the tcheles. The dye itself, as it's made, is, is blue. And yarok is also not so, uh, not so difficult to understand. As you saw some of the pictures that Rabbi Dr. Shaptai put on the screen, in the process, it does turn a yellowish greenish color and until it finally settles back, it settles into a bluish permanent, permanent color. A third machlokas we showed him that we have. Can you have tcheles from a non kosher animal? The Rabbeinu B'chai in Parshas Truma tells us that for any mitzvah, a person needs to use only those animals that are kosher to eat. The Gemara Masech Shabbos Tavchav Ches tells us, Lo huchshru lumelech shamayim elo or that when it comes to Malachas Shamayim, when it comes to using items for a mitzvah and for the Big Day Kuhuna and for the curtains in the Mishkan, they had to use kosher animals. So the Yehuda in Achuva, Madura Tzinyana, or Chaim Simon Gimel says, no, Malachas Shamayim is not related to the color of something. It relates to the material of something. When we're talking about dyes, that doesn't have to come from, uh, from, a, from a kosher animal. But that too is a machlokas. So how can I ever decide if something is the chilazan or not, if according to some it has to be from a kosher animal and according to others it's not from a kosher animal. A fourth machlokas. And Rav Yashif points out in his tshuva in Chelek Aleph, Simon Beis, that there's a machlokas Rashi and the Rambam, that according to Rashi, you're not allowed to add in any other chemicals in the dyeing process. Whereas according to the Rambam, they do put other chemicals in the dyeing process. So based on that, a number of the achronim were just hesitant to decide in these debates. And, 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 and the easy way out is to say, we just we just won't use it because I don't want to go against any of these gedolei arishonim. No less a, an authority than Rabbi Shua Lemekutna in the Sefer Yeshua's Malko writes mi yachria bismanaze between the Rashi and the Rambam. Who's going to make that decision? Lechora, this is a difficult difficult argument to understand. Mi yachria? Who's going to make a difficult decision? That's why rabbis get paid the big bucks. That's why we have gedolei aposkim to make such decisions. We, we do it all the time. Meaning. The, 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 who's going to be machria between the shach and the taz? Who's going to decide a machlokas? Even nowadays, between Rav Shlomo Zalman and Rav Moshe, who's going to decide? Who's going to decide? That's what we're supposed to do. That's that's the job. In fact, Rav Moshe Feinstein writes in a tshuva, in Yoridea Chelek Aleph, Simin Kuf Aleph, Rav Moshe writes that even sometimes if a posik determines that the halacha should be against some of the Achronim, mabikach. Some of the great achronim. He says mabikach. Why is that a big deal? Havade sherashayin af anu lach lokal achronim. We're allowed to argue on the night of Yehudas and the Chassam Sofers. The gam lefam malezer rishonim kishiyes rayos nechamos. And says Rav Moshe, we even have the right to argue on rishonim if we have proper proofs. And over here, we're not even talking about arguing on rishonim. We're talking about paskening like what we assume to be the most accepted view in rishonim. So that's a second second category of people that reject the tcheles. So category number one, those who do not trust the science. Category number two, those who, are, who, who cannot decide in such a, uh, in, in so many issues that come up that relate to discussions in the Rishonim. 
Category number three are those who say, you know what, it's not even worth considering. It's not worth studying because it can't possibly be. And this is based on two, two, uh, two subcategories. One that Moreno Agon of Shechter Shlita is going to discuss very soon, and that is the issue of Mesora, that perhaps there are those that argue you need a Mesora, you need a tradition in order to do a mitzvah. And the other that, uh, that we'll discuss briefly now is that there are those that argue that Tchelis was purposely hidden away and is not meant to come back until the days of Mashiach. That uh, the Medrash writes in Bamid Bar Rabbah, V'achshav ein lanu elolavan shatcheles nignaz. Because the tcheles was hidden away. Nignaz implies, say, a, a number of people, that HaKadosh uh, Baruch purposely hid it away. The Sifri writes that it's gonuz the tzaddikim, la'asulavo, that it's hidden away for tzaddikim, la'asulavo. And based on these ideas, the Arizal and Shara Kavanos, Indian Sitzis, Drush Talid writes that the tcheles uh, was, was, was something that they used when we had a base on the dash, but bizman hazeh, nowadays, we don't have the ability to have tcheles. We're not zoche to the kedusha that tcheles represents and that tcheles brings. And that's an argument that it doesn't matter how, how many proofs you bring and it doesn't matter how clear it is that this is in fact the genuine article. It can't be because the Arizal tells us that it can't exist without a, without a Beis HaMikdash. Now this argument is difficult to accept as well because after all, we do know that the Tcheles did exist, as Rabbi Shabtai pointed out just before, well after the Chorban Abayis. It existed well after the Beis HaMikdash. Rav Moshe Sternbach in his puts it a little bit differently. And he says, yes, yes, it may have existed in the times of the Amorayim. That may be true. But how could we possibly be, how could we possibly think in our generation, she'ein hester kamahu, where there's so much hester panim, where Hashem is hidden from us, that yiskala hatcheles, that the tcheles is going to be revealed, it's a difficult argument to accept. I don't know why Hashem runs the world the way He does. I don't know why Hashem chose to make it that we have tchelis accessible to us. One could equally ask the question, why should it be that in a generation of so much darkness, where we live in such a darta puchos, where we live in where, 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 where so much is upside down and so much is going backwards, and, and yet there are more people learning Torah in Bate Medrash and Yeshivas than ever existed? How are we, Zochet, to such opportunities and to such Kedusha? I don't know, but we should say thank you. It's Thanksgiving. We should say thank you that we are zochet to such things. A very difficult argument to accept that because we live in a time that lacks kedusha, that it can't be that we have tcheles. Uh, and even that lashon of nignaz, it could just mean that it wasn't available. It does not necessarily mean that uh, that that it's, it was purposely nignaz by Hashem. In fact, even the Arizal, who makes this comment about how we are not zochet to the until we have a Beis HaMikdash, uh, it's not so clear that we're supposed to follow the Ariza Lahalacha when he says things that are not Lahalacha. Meaning, Rav Yaakov Moshe Hillel in his Chuvas Vayashav Hayan in Simul Chaf writes, as a rule, Rak im Omer Lehedya Bederech Ho'ra'a Shekein Sarich Linog that when do we follow the Ariza halacha? When he says it as a psak halacha, that this is what you shall do. And Rav Moshe writes in a tshuva, and then you treat the Ariza like any other of the gedolei achronim, where we, he can be outvoted. But 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 he only is 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 he, he's only granted an, an opinion in halacha when he's expressing it as an opinion in halacha, as something that one is supposed to do, even if it's al-pi Kabbalah, but it's l'ma'aseh. But if he just says something that is not meant l'ma'aseh, then that is not something that we are supposed to follow from the Ariza. And then there's a final group, and this is perhaps the most, uh, the smallest group, I would imagine, or at least on the books, the smallest group, and the most um, difficult to understand of all of them. And that is the group that would not wear tcheles, uh, even after having seen all of the proofs, being convinced by all of the proofs that they are in fact correct, and, and still, for whatever reason, would shy away from wearing the tcheles. Now, why on earth would someone do that if you're convinced that it's real and you have an opportunity for a mitzvah do raisa? Can you imagine if you were stranded on a desert island somewhere and you didn't have tefillin with you? And then you were rescued 
and you saw a pair of tefillin for the first time in years, now imagine that it wasn't just years, that it was thousands of years or a thousand years. And it wasn't just you, nobody for a thousand years was able to do this clear mitzvah da'oraisa. And you see that there's an opportunity for a mitzvah da'oraisa. And, and you're convinced that this is it, that this is, this is the real thing. How could you not jump at the opportunity? So there are a number of posts in that said, well, I'll tell you how you how you could not jump at the opportunity. Rav Mendel Shafran, a chashva dayan from Bnei Brak, wrote in a tshuva, he says, there's no doubt that that, that these, these murak snails are in fact the chilazon and that they produce kosher tcheles. There's no doubt, he says. Anyone had dvarim midabrim ba'adatzmam, he writes. The matter speaks for itself. But he says the reason that rov gedolei Yisrael do not use it is eno mishum shemifak bekim ba'amitas ha'inyan. It's not because they deny the truth and validity of it. El mishum shebemasayim shana ha'achronim nikva karagasha pnimis shalom mishanim dvarim gam imin hadin ha'yetzarech la'anhigam olishanosam. That there's this intuitive sense that gedolim have had in the last couple of hundred years that we don't change things, that we don't change the way we observe our religion, even if logic would dictate that you should change. Well, well why not? If logic would dictate that I found the mitzvah daraisa, why not? And he explains. V'zeh kahagana neged maharsim amenasim l'shanu salahatim. Because there are those that want to change a lot of other things as well. There are those that want to change some of the basic beliefs of our religion, those that want to change some of the basic mitzvahs that we all agree one must observe. And once we give an inch, they're going to take a foot. They're going to take a mile. Once we give an inch into change, well, why can you change that? And why can't we change everything else? And he said, and therefore, this is begeder. That the Chachamim will uproot something in Torah by telling us to be passive and not to do a mitzvah. Uh, interestingly, uh, Rav Shafran, in that tshuva, Rav Shafran is a dying in Bnei Brak, he said that applies to anyone who belongs to a traditional community. But if you belong to a newer community that is developing newer minhagim, then perhaps you can develop a minhag that you wear tcheles. And he views the Datilu Umi community in Eretz Yisrael as a newer community developing newer minhagim, and he therefore says they are authorized to wear tcheles. But the Haredi community is unauthorized to do so. A very shocking assertion to make that uh, that, that would be the case. Uh, the, you, have, you have a similar argument that Moreno Agon Rav Shechter Shlita presents in the name of Rav Yitzhak al or was said in the name of uh, Rav Yitzhak al and Rav Shechter presents it in the Sefer Ginas Ego, Simon Bey's Ozvav, that even though he thought that the Ritziner Tcheles was in fact the correct Tcheles, he refused to wear it because of political reasons. He was busy fighting the reform. He was fighting so many battles. And if you start doing things that look funny and that look strange, then uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to fight those battles. So Morena of Shechter Shlita wrote, who dover tamua ma'od. Very strange to say something like that. We do what, what we believe the Torah tells us we're supposed to do. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will take care of the rest. How can we ignore a mitzvah daraisa because we think it's going to affect our kiruv, uh, our abilities in kiruv? I mean, think about it for a moment. Who, who is most successful in drawing in Jews from all walks of life to connect to Judaism in one way or another? Let's be honest about it. Throughout the world. People who dress in the most modern dress and who make sure that they're always clean shaven, uh, the Chabad Shluchim all over the world are, are more uh, successful at Kiruv than probably almost anybody else. There's nothing that uh, that they do that tries to conform to society around them. It's you do what you think is right and then everything else, you trust that Kodesh Baruch Hu will take care of everything else. Then one final matter that maybe uh, Rav Shachter will discuss maybe 
about the idea that uh, if no one else in shul is wearing it and I wear it, isn't that a violation of los iskodidu? And this was an argument that was put forth by Rav Sternbach Shlita. But Moreno Rav Shechta Shlita said, well, if no one else has a lulav in shul and you have a lulav, it's not a violation of los iskodidu to use it. So again, just to quickly summarize, those who are against it, it's not because there's any explicit Gemara against it, and it's not even because you have anything to lose by wearing the trelas. Either it comes from a suspicion of science in general or this particular science. It comes from a, a hesitation to paskin in a machlokas rishonim. It comes from an understanding that al pi Kabbalah it must be hidden, or it comes from a general hesitation based on uh, political reasons or reasons relating to uh, what what it might lead to, even though it in fact is correct. And I feel that sometimes when studying the opposition, we're more uh, the studying the reasons to be opposed. If we're less, if we're unconvinced by any of those reasons, it will leave us with no choice but to look at the evidence that uh, is overwhelmingly in favor of the idea that we should wear tchelis. I was talking to one of the great rabbanim of our generation who does not wear tchelis and has given shiurim against it, and uh, he said, I really hope you're right. I really hope it is the real tchelis. I just don't believe it, but I really hope it is. And he told me his own son wears the tchelis because his son is convinced. He said, I'm not convinced. My son is convinced. I hope you're right. And my son gets a mitzvah araisa each and every day. And uh, again, with that, I thank you so much for coming to learn uh, together with me this evening. And uh, everyone should have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Rabbi Leibowitz. Uh, thank you for giving us your time. And thank you for all the Torah that you disseminate on a regular basis. Uh, thank you for offering clarity on the on the point and counterpoint on this uh, very significant and uh, complicated at times topic. It's now a great privilege and a great honor to welcome Mori Varebi, Harav Shechter Shlita uh, this evening. The uh, final word, not only the final speaker, but the final word for us on this uh, topic. I want to take this opportunity, Rebbe, on behalf of Klal Yisrael, to thank Rebbe for the leadership, for the Piskei Halacha, for the tshuvas that have guided us over these eight, nine months. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that we would have been lost without Rebbe's guidance, not only halachically, but that sense of calmness and that sense of, uh, of peaceful uh, and serene way of guiding us through Yom and Tovim and through difficult shailas. And for us to be at ease to know that we have a posek and we have a gadol and we have a rav and a Rebbe upon whom we can rely in, in crises and in difficult circumstances and in the best of times is a tremendous gift for which we are all incredibly grateful. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu just continue to give Rebbe only good strength and good health to continue to guide us, to continue to teach us, to continue to inspire us. Everybody knows that Rav Shechter is Rosh Hashiva, Rosh Kolal, Rav Yitzchuk Achanan, Posek of the OU, and Posek for so, so much more. On this uh, topic, uh, a final and third perspective, the question of wearing Tchelas within the Mesora to be able to have one of the Balea Masora of our generation uh, present is truly an honor and a privilege. I'll never forget in, in Meisham Geula even, when you walk into Svarim stores that sell Tchelas and they have samples and models for the different ways that Tchelas can, can possibly be tied on a garment. It has uh, hanging off the corner an example, Rashi, Rambam, Rav Shechter, among the examples of opinions of exactly what is the right way to tie. And that in itself, not that that's uh, evidence uh, that we need of Rav Schechter's authority in this area and in so many others. Rabbi, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Without any further ado, Rav Schechter Shlit. Shalom Aleichem. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I find this very educating. I didn't know all these uh, uh, ideas that the first two speakers presented. Uh, and this is a wonderful idea. This should be a Haskola every Thanksgiving. We, even when we'll have Shonen Kutikuna, we should organize your, why not? That's a beautiful way to celebrate the Thanksgiving. Uh, when the Radzina Rebbe came up with his Chiddush regarding the uh, Chalazen, he thought that he had identified which is the correct Chalazen. So as the previous speakers pointed out, many Rabbanim agreed with him and many disagreed. So it's known that the Beis HaLevi, that was the great-grandfather of Rabbi Yosef Dov HaLevi Salavechik, who used to teach in Yeshiva University, the Rav, his great-grandfather, after whom he was named, Yosef Dev HaLevi, he was opposed. But there are two totally different versions of why he was opposed. So the Radzina Rebbe put out three different svarim. Now they print all the three svarim in one volume that's called Shloshe Sifri HaTcheles. And the third sefer, he has all of the reactions of the various rabbanim from all over Europe to his chiddush. 
the, his discovery of the Chalos. So he has a letter from uh, a person who claims to be an acquaintance, a close acquaintance of the Beis HaLevi, doesn't give you the name of the person, and he sends a letter to the Radzina Rebbe to say why the Beis HaLevi, why Rabbi Yosheb Salavechik was opposed, and he says the following. This, uh, what they say, the cuttlefish or whatever, the squid fish. Uh, he said, this fish was known to our parents and our grandparents, and they knew that it spits up uh, black uh, fluid, and they never used it. So how can you tell me that this is the chalazan? If th the fact that our parents, our grandparents knew about this fish, that, it's, that it has this black uh, fluid uh, in it, and they didn't use that fluid to, to as chalazan, indicates that we have a masora, that it's wrong. That's why we can't accept what you said. But if you would come up with some other fish and give us a historical explanation as to why the trailers disappeared in the days of the Goonim, he says, I'll be the first one to go along with you and I'll use the, the trailers. But it cannot be this fish because it's like we have a masora that it's wrong because our parents knew about this and they didn't use this dye. The Soloveitchik family, both the family in Eretz Yisrael, the children of Velvala Soloveitchik and his grandchildren, and the Soloveitchiks in America, the children of Ramosha Soloveitchik, and I think the Soloveitchik family in Switzerland as well, they all have a totally different version of what the Beis Alevi said. Their version is that in order to identify what the Chalazan is, you have to have a Masora. And a Masora has to be ish mipish, has to be an oral transmission from one generation of a religious person to the next generation. You cannot restore a Masora, if a Masora was lost, you cannot restore a Masora by looking in a dictionary or by archaeological proofs, even if archaeology is emis, but that's not called a Masora. You have to have a Masora, you have to have a tradition from religious people telling all the other religious people what the, what the Chalazan is. And in fact, this is the way uh, Rab Salvechik is to say, uh, the Gemara says that if you eat uh, ores, um, there's one opinion, Rabbi Yechen ben Nuri is of the opinion that there, there are not just chameshus mini dogon, wheat, barley, oats, rye, and spelt, that ores is also min dogon. So, this is, so we don't pass like Rabbi Yechen ben Nuri, ores with dochen. We don't pass like Rabbi Yechon Nuri, but a little bit we accept his opinion. So the Gemara says in Brochus that if you eat ores, the Brocha in it, the Brocha before you eat it is barim minim zaynus, and the Brocha after you finish eating it is not alamichia, but rather barim So what is ores? So Taisa says only ores, not dochen. So the question is: So what is ores and what is dochen? So one opinion is ores is rice and dochen is millet or something else, and the other opinion is no, dochen is rice. So if you ask, I live in Washington Heights. If you ask any of the neighbors here, we have a lot of Puerto Rican neighbors. Everybody knows our rose is rice. You ask any Arab in Eretz Yisrael, our rose is rice. In different languages all over the world, or is is uh, something like, or is our rose is right. So the Salavechik say, no, since the Masora was lost, what is or is? And the distinguishes between our and Dochen. It's only or is that you say the Baruch HaVishayna is and the Baruch HaKhreina is Baruch Since we don't know which one is Oriz, even though you have all the dictionaries in the world to indicate that Oriz is the rice, we don't follow the dictionary. We lost the Masora, so it's a Sveke Dina. so you don't say Baruch Minim Zainus on rice. You say Baruch Prihadom, because it grows from the ground. This is what they insist. So whenever Rav Salvechik uh, would say this over, when he said it in Yeshiva, so the students we used to tremble when he said this year. So we, no one ever asked them. We rarely asked any kashas in the middle. You can't say no one ever asked. We didn't dare to ask kashas in the middle of year. When he used to say this for the Balabatim, the Balabatim didn't sit there so much. So remember the Balabatim, when he used to give this year every Tuesday night to Maria. Maria was a shul in the middle of Manhattan on Broadway, in the corner of Broadway and Hadia Street. So every Tuesday night, Rav Salvechi gave Yishir there for many, many years. So when he said it there, the Balabatim were free to ask kashas. So they said, how can you say that, that you don't, if you don't have a tradition, uh, you can't restore a tradition based on archaeology. The Gemara in the middle of Barbasu tells about Rabbi Bar Barchona, who was taking, uh, he had an Arab, Ahutaya, 
sounds like a plain Arab, was giving them a guided tour of the Midbar, where the Mesa Midbar were. He was showing Rabbi Babahana where the dead Jewish bodies were who died in the days of Moshe Abena. The bodies were still there. And then he showed him where Blue Korach, where Korach Vadosa got Eingezunk when they were swallowed up uh, in the under the ground in the earth. So, and, the, and the, Rabbi Babahana leaned over and I heard him screaming at Moshe Emes, Vasarosa Emes, Vanachlan Badoim. So that when Rabbi Barbahana came back to the yeshiva and he was telling all the Talmidim in the yeshiva about his summer tour, where he traveled in the summertime, and the Arabs showed them the Mesa Midbar, so they asked Rabbi Barbahana, did you check the tzitzis to see who's right? Because there's a machlek, is Bisham and Bishilol, how many strings they put on tzitzis. So Bishilol are of the opinion to take three long strings, he fold them over, it turns out to be six. And Bishamah are of the opinion to take four long strings, he fold them over to make eight. This is one of the, there are many disputes, Bisham and Basilo. Ruba, the Ruba, the overwhelming majority of the cases we pass on like Basilo. But Taisus points out in the beginning of Sukkah, Dav Gimel, there are six cases. We have a tradition from this Rav Amram Gohan, right, in the Siddur, that uh, there are six cases in Shas where we pass on like the Bisham, in addition to the Yud Chaz but we also pass on like Bisham. The Yud Chaz Dover, the next day when the Basilo came back to the base Madrash, so the Basilo agreed with the Bisham. So that uh, those 18 cases don't count. But there are six cases where there's really a dispute, Bisham and Basil, and we pass them like the Bisham. So one of them is you take four strings, you fold them up, you make eight. So they asked Rabbi Babahana, did you look at the tzitzes of the Mesa Midbot to see in the days of Moshe Abena, did they do like Basil or like Bishamai? So he says, it didn't occur to me to look, to try to be posh at the Machlekes who's right. So they said to him, what an idiot, you're a moron. Rabbi Babahana is so stupid. He see the Mesa Mid, but not even try to check to see. But if Rabbi Salavetchik is right, if the way they say from the Beis Halevi, that if you don't have a Masur, you can't restore a Masur in Halacha by archaeology, period. It, no Masur is so bad. It, it's wrong, and even, even if it's right, it's wrong. If you don't have a Masur, so what, why would they angry Rabbi Babahana if it, it's not going to help at all? Then there's also a Gemara. The Gemara has in the days of the Tanoim who were discussing the issue, there was already no Beis HaMikdash. So the Tanoim had a machlek, as the Kengodl was supposed to wear the tzitz. Hoy al mitzcho tomid. Al mitzcho, we usually assume, means on his forehead. And Taisus quotes that the Targum Unkelis translates al mitzcho bene nohi. Sounds like tefillin is supposed to be. Hoyur tetov is bene necha. Bene necha means above the hair. The tefillin shorosh is over here. So Taisus says it would appear from the Targum Unkelis that the tzitz was over here. It wasn't on the forehead. Al, al mitzchah rather means over here, on the hair, wherever. So that so the, the Chumash says that you have to have engraved on the tzitz two words, Kodesh la Hashem. So there's a machlagis hatanoim. None of these tanoim live bizman abayis, and they're discussing something that they never saw. Each one had a tradition from earlier generation. What did it look like? So one opinion is that the two words were straight in a row, Kodesh la Hashem. The other opinion is no, very strange. It said Kodesh, Lamed, and on a higher line above that, it said Yudke Vavke. So that Shem Yudke Vavke should be above the line where it says Kodesh La. Kodesh La and Yudke Vavke higher. Machlag is Hatanoim. So one Tane says, Don't tell me, I was in Rome. The Gemara tells the whole story of what he was doing in Rome. He was in Rome, and he and he did a favor to the emperor. He saved the emperor's uh, grandchild or something like that, or his daughter. I forgot the whole story. And then they asked him whatever he wants. He can go in the in the um, in the um, in the Vatican and take whatever he wants from the uh, from the uh, Beso Oitza that they have. So he saw that they had the tzitz. They had Caleb from the Beis He had the tzitz. And the tzitz had Kodesh La Shem in one line. It wasn't on two lines, Kodesh La and Yud Ke Vav Ke above. So he quotes this as a raya. He's, he's proving what the din is based on archaeology. So you see the Ferish, the Tanoim do believe in, there was no, there was no Masora. There was a Machlag Tanoim. There was no clear Masora how he's supposed to write Kodesh La Shem. And that being Pesha, the Machlag is based on archaeology. So you see that it is legitimate. It is a way to restore a, a Masora. What's strange is that the Rambam Paskins against that. The Gemara says he saw that it sits in Rome, and it's on one line, and then the Rambam Paskins is supposed to be on two lines. So the 
Kesef Mishnah, if Yosef Kara in his commentary on the Rama Meir, how does he paskin against the Metzias? But they saw it in Rome. They, they, they saw the tzitz. It's on one line. So the Kesef Mishnah says, every kind of had to wear a tzitz that would fit his head or his forehead, wherever he's supposed to put it. So some of the Kohen Gadolim had a wide head, some had a narrow head, some, some were taller than others, some were fatter than others, and so on. So there must have been many, many tzitzim. There were many Kohen Gadolim. There must have been many tzitzim. So just because they found one, they had Kodesh Lashem on one line, doesn't necessarily mean that they were all made like that. That's what the Kesem Mishnah says, that Ramam thinks the din should be, should be on two lines, and they happen to find the quirk of a tzitz, just like there was a Machlekes Hatanaim. So through the generations, there was a Machlekes of the Quran and Gedolim, how you're supposed to make the tzitz. So some that made it in one line, and the Ram says, more correct, it's supposed to be on two lines. That's what the Kesem Mishnah says. But I'll call upon him, don't you see from the whole discussion of the Tanaim, that you can reconstruct, uh, you can revive a Masora based on archaeology. And then the Rishonim quote, there was a Machlekes Rashi and the Rabbi Natam about the Seder HaParshias in the Tefillin, how, how, do you, how do you arrange the four parshas in the Shalrosh? So the Rishonim quote, the Mordechai quotes this in, in, in the tour, they quote, the Prisha quotes it in the tour. They found in Keva Yecheskel Navi. I think he's buried in Bavel. They found the Keva Yecheskel Navi. they claim, they found a parrot film there have been like Rabbein Tam, the two Vahoyos in the middle, and it's an old pair of film from, from, from the days of the Bais Rishon, from the days of Yechezkel Nabi. So doesn't that show that the, that the Rabbeinu Tam is right, that that's the correct Seder HaParshios? So the others claimed maybe they were puzzled at film. That's why they, that's where they were going as them. And the, the Kevah Yechezkel maybe they were puzzled. Who says that they were kosher? Maybe they were puzzled. Or others suggest that's in the Torah Shlema, he has a suggestion. Uh, maybe the din that the Seder HaParshios is Miakev, Maybe that was a dinder abanan that was developed in the later generations in the days of the Gemara. Maybe because otherwise you don't understand how could they be a machlegis rashi and rabbeinu tam? What's the seder haparshis? Nobody knows what they did last year. A mitzvah that you do every single day of the year. How can it be that they forgot what's the seder? So that's what the Rabbi Mendel Kasha suggests in the Torah Shlema that uh, maybe the din always was you have to have dalat parshas, whatever order you have is acceptable. And then in the days of the Amaroim, they came up with the din, the Rabbon, and the new Chiddush has to be dafk in a certain order, and that's Machleg, it's Rashi Rabbeinu Tam, what's the correct order? So it's not going to help that you're going to find from the older generations a pair of tefillin like the Seder of the Rabbeinu Tam, like the Seder of Rashi, because in the earlier generation, the Seder wasn't Meyakev, so any, any Seder you're going to have is going to be good. But from the fact that they take this whole discussion seriously, What's the whole shot in the first place? If you say that you, you don't follow, you don't follow uh, archaeology, you have to have a Masori Ish Mipish of Moshe Abenu. And if you don't have a Masori, even if you're right, you're not right by definition. Everything has to be with Masori. So uh, what was the whole problem that they found? So this, these are the two versions of why the Beis Halevi, why Rabbi Yashabir Salavechik was opposed to the Radzina Rebbe's trailers. The Soloveitchik family claims all of the, the American branch and the Israeli branch, they all claim in the name of the Beis Alevi because the Masara was lost and you can't reconstruct the Masara. Masara has to be Ish Mipiish Amosha Abeinu, that we heard from religious Jews in an earlier generation. This is the way to do it. You can't reconstruct the Masara. And the others say, in the net, and, and the acquaintances sent a letter to the Radzina Rebbe, the Radzina Rebbe printed their letter. He says, if you come up with a different fish and, and you'd explain historically why the trailers disappeared in the days of the Gonim, I'll be the first one to go along with you. But you tell me uh, that it's this, the cuttlefish, so it can't be because our grandparents knew about that fish and that it spits out the black dye and they didn't use it. So it's as if we have a masori that you're wrong. But he says, you don't need a masori. So it's a glaring contradiction, what the, what the Beis Alevi said. There's a very big Tamachachim. He used to be in Flatbush, Rabbi Feivel Cohen, the author of the Swarim HaShulchan, the Badi HaShulchan. So he was the rabbi in a shul in Flatbush, and he used to give shurim every week. And he wanted to go spend time. He wanted to spend a year in Eretz Yisrael to get Shimush, to pick up Shimush by Rabbi Yashif. So he told his Balabatim that uh, he, he wants to give up his Rabbanus. So they said, why? Everybody gets them, they like him. So he said he wants to get Shimush by Rabbi Yashif. 
and it's not fair that he should ask them to hold his rabbinical position for him for a year, and then he's going to come back. He's going to go away for you. So they loved him so much that he said, you go to Eretz Yisrael, spend as much time as you want, and it's your position. When you come back, you'll continue to be our rabbi. They spent a year there by Rabbi Yashif. He's a very big Talmud Chacham. His form are exceptionally beautiful. So when he came back, he maintained a kesher with uh, Rabbi Yashiv. He used to correspond with him. Rabbi Yashiv hardly writes uh, to anybody. So he maintained the kesher with him. So he sent him a letter regarding this uh, trelis. He said he explained there are two versions of what the Beis Alevi said. Which version does he think is correct? And so then Rabbi Yashiv said he doesn't understand the version of the Soloveitchik family does not make sense to him. He thinks that the other version is more correct. Not that you need a Masora Ish Mepish. And the Gemara, you see, it can restore a Masora based on archaeology. He thought that that's not, he thought that the Soloveitchik family version is not correct. The other version is more correct. So then Rabbi Feivlokon asked him, so what do you say about the new Trelas? If you don't have to have a Masora, so what do you say? So he said, he doesn't know. He has to think about it. He doesn't know. So the story goes that uh, the people from the Trelas factory in Eretz Yisrael went to Rabbi Yashiv, they made an appointment, he gave them a whole presentation. So he asked them, how much does it cost for a pair of trailers? So they said something like whatever, $100 for a pair of trailers. Then he said, do you have 50,000? Uh, do you have available 50,000? So they said, no. So then he said, what's going to happen if tomorrow 50,000 people will ask for trailers? How much will it cost? So they said, we don't have 50,000. We're going to have to charge much more money. If it's going to be such a great demand and we have hardly, hardly any supply, it's going to cost more. So he said, I can't put on trailers. I can't put on trailers because I'll be putting people's lives in danger. And he explained what he means. He says, people always want to know, what do I do? There are people in Meir Shorim, there are people in Bnei Brak. He said there are around 50,000 people who want to know Dafke what he does. And whatever he does, they're going to spend money. He says, as it is, they don't make enough money to give enough nourishment to their children, to their family, and they're undernourished. And he says, if people will find out that I'm wearing trailers, tomorrow 50,000 people will spend all the money that's necessary to buy the trailers. And as it is, they're undernourished. They're not healthy because they spend, they don't spend enough money on, on healthy food. So I can't do it. I'll be putting people's lives in suck on it. Shai, that's a beautiful explanation. So one of the Chachamim, one of the brilliant people who was there at the meeting, put out a book, and he wrote up the whole story in the book. The Rabbi Yasha said the reason why he's not using Trelis is, uh, is because he's going to put people's lives in Saka, saying that uh, if you're not worried about your Sakana, so you should wear the Trelis. So they told Rabbi Yasha that someone who was there by the meeting wrote up the whole thing. So it doesn't help that he's not wearing the Trelis. So he asked them, he has no time. Please, someone write in my name that I don't hold from the trailers. So someone wrote that shuva that was that was printed, that, that was mentioned earlier, Rabbi Yashiv's shuva. Someone wrote that shuva. And then they publicized it. It was printed in some Torah journal. So then the next day after it was printed, someone meets Rabbi Yashiv, and he says, I saw your shuva that you quoted the Arizal, that it only makes sense to wear trailers bismanch habes and make the shoikaim. So he said, I didn't write that shuva. <laughs> what do you mean he didn't write that Shuvah has his name? He asked someone, write in my name that I don't hold from the Chelas. So the person wanted to schmaltz it up. So he said, because Darizal says it only makes sense. So Rabbi Yashiv said, it can't be. The Arizal is not, is not going to say something against the Halacha. The Arizal is coming to explain historically how did HaKadosh Baruch Hu allow such a tragedy to occur that the, that the identity of the Chalazan and, and the ability to fulfill the mitzvah of trailers was lost. How can HaKadosh Bochu be so mean to us to allow such a tragedy to occur? You should have seen to it that it should be preserved. So that reason is just explaining the Iker to Elis of the trailers only makes sense besides After the Chorban Abayis, he's still Mechuyiv. The Tanoim and Amoram lived after the Chorban Abayis. Until the days of the Goenim, they still had trailers. He's just explaining historically, but not saying halachically that there's no mitzvah to put on trailers. And what does it mean that the, that the historically it's not such a great uh, tragedy if the trellis is lost? So they explain, I think the Satma Rebbe has this in his, one of his uh, essays that he published, that there's a Gemara in Brochas that says, 
when you see the blue, be beautiful sky uh, above, so you say a certain bracha. So then the Gemara said, but we don't say that bracha anymore because since the days of the Chub Meis Amigdush, the sky is not the right color blue. This mantra Beis Amigdush Ha'ikayim, the blue sky was a different color blue. So that's what Darizal says, that the trellis is supposed to be done with the rakia, and the rakia has the wrong color blue, so that's why the, the din of trellis still applies, even with Mancha and Beis Amigdush Kaim. But since it's a different color blue, so the Ika Toyelis is not there, so it was lost. But he never, he never really said that uh, the reason never meant to say at all that the mitzvah doesn't apply. I remember when one of the representatives uh, from the Hevra who made the trellis when he came to the yeshiva, he wanted to give me a presentation one day of the trellis. I said, why only give to me? Let's announce that at the end of the Seder today, I'll give a presentation, the last 45 minutes or the last hour of the Kerala Seder, so he said, fine. So he gave a presentation. After he gave the whole presentation, I said, okay, um, I agree that it's at least a suffix. I don't know if it's a vade. I agree it's at least a suffix. I want to buy the trailers. Mask, I want to buy it. So they said, they don't have it yet. They didn't begin to process it yet. They're planning to do it. So I said, when you when you do it, I want to buy it. So that's when I started to use it. I think it's at least a suffix there. I said, it's at least a suffix, even if it's not a vade. A sophic there is a lechumer. So me sophic, you have to use trellis. There are some who argue the point and say that sophic there is a lechumer only means the following: If I have a sophic, whether I have a chiv to do a mitzvah, so I should go lechumer and do it. So I know for sure that I was yotzei the mitzvah. But here, even if you will put in the trellis, he's still not sure. Even after you use the trellis, still not sure whether you have accomplished anything. So some pas can hold that sophic there is a lechumer doesn't apply in such a case. It only applies in a case where after after saying lechumra, then you know for sure that you were yotzei the mitzvah. So Ramenachem Zember, who was killed by the Nazis in the Warsaw Ghetto, writes about this in one of his svarim, and he writes that idea appears in the Shulchan Aruch Arab, the Balatanya Shulchan Aruch, that you only apply so, and other poskim also have it. They only apply suffix so, deraisa lechumra in a situation where after going lechumra. You know for sure that you will have fulfilled the mitzvah, but he said that's not the accepted opinion in the big Shulchan Aruch. And he quotes Beferish that if it's the first day of Sukkot and you didn't shake the first day of Sukkot, mitzvah to shake the lulav is menatorah. The rest of Sukkot is only made the rabbanan outside of the Beis Hamikdash. So the first day of Sukkot, if you didn't shake the lulav a whole day long, and now it's already Ben Hashmashes of the end of the day, so then we say Sofik Daraisa Lachumer. Maybe Ben Hashmashes is Yom. And you have to shake the lulav during Ben Hashmash's Beli Bracha. But even if you shake the lulav Ben Hashmash's, you don't know, maybe you didn't fulfill anything. Maybe Ben Hashmash's is Lila, you have accomplished nothing. So, the, so Rabbi Nachman Zeman says, you see from the Shulchan Aruch that you apply Safik Daraisa Luchum, even in such a situation where after going Luchum, you still don't know whether you have accomplished anything or not. I remember many years ago, I must have spoken about trailers. I don't know. Someone meets me in, in Los Angeles. I was there for the OU weekend. I was in the end of December. Uh, for many years, I used to go. So uh, someone asked me, are there any sources in the Talmud that the trailers uh, is poisonous? So I said, what do you mean? He tells me he works for the federal government. Uh, there are regulations that you're not allowed to put used dye in a jacket or a sweater or a tie that has poison, because little children will chew on their sweaters. And if it has poison, they may get sick, and they may get sick from sucking the poison. So that's what his job is, to test all the dyes and all of the clothing to make sure nobody's violating this federal law. So he had it for the heck of it, so he tested the color of the halazan, uh, of the dye that they use now that they call trellis, and he says it is poisonous, it is a little dangerous. So after I understood what he's talking about, whether the halosin is poisonous, I told him that Rashi in his comment, I don't know of any community passage, has said Rashi in his commentary on Chumash has an argument with the Ramam, what color is the halosin? What color is the trellis? Is it dark blue or is it light blue? So the Ramam writes, it's the color of the sky in the afternoon. And Rashi says it's the color of the sky at night, at midnight. Why? Trellis is lush and tichla, death, and Trelis is supposed to represent Makas Bechoris that took place, we should read by looking at the dark, dark blue, the dark of the midnight, we should reminisce about Makas Bechoris. 
So I said, maybe according to the, what Rashi interprets, I don't know where Rashi got it from. Maybe that's in a medrash. I don't know. Maybe according to that, it makes sense that it should be that it should be uh, poison. The Beis Alevi has an interesting comment. Maybe I'll close with this. Beis Alevi has a tshuva about Tchelis. He discusses the din of Baltigra. When does one violate Baltigra? So uh, Rashi and Chumash sounds like he says, if you have a talis that has four corners, you only put tzitzis in three out of the four corners, you're in violation of Baltigra. If you have tefillin, instead of having four parshas, you have only have three, that's a violation of Baltigra. So the Beis Alevi quotes a Rashbo, and I think in Masech Chas Rosh Hashanah, based on the Rajba, he's not happy with that Rashi al Torah. He thinks that that's not Baltigra. If you wear tefillin, that only has three parshios. You're just not Yotzi. So you didn't, that's not Baltigra. You didn't, you're on the bottom limit, so have tefillin. If you wear tzitzis, that only has tzitzis in three corners, doesn't have in the fourth corner. So the Mishnah has a machlek is hatanoim. Rabbi Shmuel holds that you have three quarters of the Yom Akaim. Each corner is another mitzvah, so you Akaim three mitzvahs, and you missed one mitzvah. And we pass again against Rabbi Shmuel, that the tzitzis in the four corners are ma'ak from zeh, zeh. So if you're missing tzitzis in one of the four corners, you have zero kiyama mitzvah. You're not yotze anything at all. So we pass like that. So that's what the Beit Salevi says. That's not Baltigra. If you're not yotze in the mitzvah, you're not yotze. So when do you violate Baltigra? So one example he gives is, uh, the Mishnah has an example. If you have a korban chatos, that's supposed to have zrikas, on four karnas on his and you only do one zrika. So we pass committee Yevid, that's a machlik, it's Bisham and Bisil. We pass committee Yevid only one maton, one zrika is ma'akib. So he did one zrika, the korban is kosher, but he only yotze bidi Yevid. So the Mishnah and Zvachim said that's an example of Baltigra. The Beis Alevi says the same by tzitzis. If you have treilis and lovan, that's a mitzvah bishlay mus. If you put in lovan without treilis, a treilis without lovan, you only become a mitzvah shalom bishlay mus. So that's a violation of Baltigra. So how did the do how did the Jews wear tzitzis all the generations? They wore treilis without lovan. So the Beis Alevi says that was esse doichaloi sesi. Since the treilis was not available, so under the circumstances, the mitzvah to put in lovan is doichel avera of Baltigra because we had no choice. It's the the kaim But if you live in a generation where the treilis may be available. It could be that what they have is trailers. Some are convinced that it's absolutely the case. And uh, it's at least a suffix. So if you have trailers is available, you don't use it, then you'll be in violation of Baltigra. So wouldn't it be better not to wear tzitzis at all? Those who are afraid, they're afraid to get involved. So let them not wear Arba Kampus at all. Because by wearing Arba, by wearing Arba Kampus, if you don't wear a garment with four corners, you're not mukhayif to wear tzitzis. If you wear a garment with four corners, then you have to put in tzitzis. And you're not putting in tzitzis. And you could have. We have the trailers available. You don't put it in. So that's that's a, that's a violation. So it's better not to wear the whole Arba Kampus in the first place. That's what the Beis Alevi writes. So I think uh, it's what to consider seriously, that uh, it's not really right that, uh, that people don't um, avail themselves of the trailers. We live in a generation that uh, Baruch Hashem Things are picking up for the Jewish people. There's more learning, and in a certain sense, there's more shmiras ha-mitzvah. So this, then Hashemayim, there were mezakas. I enjoyed the presentation before. How can we decide, based on the historical proof, that how can it be that men Hashemayim, they're not going to give our generation the schus? Who says? We have the schus that we got Medina Sisro. That's a fantastic, who would have believed that we got Medina Sisro? Thank you very much. I enjoyed the evening. I listened to all the drushes from the beginning to the end. And I hope mine was also a bit of a contribution. Everyone should be healthy. And next year you should have again. Ayarchi Kala on Thanksgiving. I want to thank Rebbe so much for Rebbe's time tonight and Rebbe's insight. Uh, in fact, we're listening to Rebbe right away because we already have another program planned for the evening of January 1st, what they call New Year's Eve. Again, to not uh, waste it or allow it to pass us by, but another night of total learning. So Mitz Hashem, We'll promote and we'll share soon about the uh, lineup uh, for that evening. I want to thank uh, Rav Shechter Shlita. I want to thank Rabbi Leibowitz, Rabbi Dr. Shabtai. It was an incredible evening. And by the outpouring of participation live tonight, and I'm sure that will follow when people will listen to the recording, I think it's a testament to our speakers, a testament to the topic, and most of all, a testament to Klai Yisrael and the thirst for, for Talmud Torah. Yashikoach to all and wishing everyone a wonderful Shabbos.